Vaidishwaran sir will speak about fragmented assessments. I will talk about consolidated assessments. That's the way, if I have to say, because under GST, you fragment a single entity into multiple states, and you assess each state as if it's a separate unit of assessment. In consolidation, we try and do something different, that you try and aggregate all of them and make one composite assessment. So what is this consolidation? Why the time has come? I will just leave a brief. If you look at the Nifty 50 companies, on an average, I am taking off an average, each Nifty 50 company has 30 subsidiaries, uh, 50 subsidiaries. Each BSC uh, listed company has about 30 subsidiaries. Now for a corporate group which is having a same think tank and is organized many of his companies through subsidiaries, whether you should have 30 assessments and 30 14 year disallowances or you can live with only one 14 year disallowance and get away with the rest of the thing. I think this is the point which we has to be addressed. That should not ease of business also means a consolidated assessment mechanism that all things which are controlled are having a common economic unity that should all be assessed together. I think that's the principle on which consolidation is based. So if I have to say the first point I would like to say is economic unity. In any taxation, you can go into the Supreme Court rulings. It will say there are four components which are required for levying a tax. One is the character of levy. The character of levy here, what we are discussing, it will continue to be a tax on income. It is not that the, it will change the character. What is the person on whom the levy should be made? That is where the alteration is going to be made. So far, we have chosen the person of levy to be each company as a separate entity, and we are taking it as a taxable unit. What this concept will do is that go with the economic unity, aggregate all of them, and find one common unity, and find one taxable person which will take care of all the companies together. After all, I have organized myself into different entities, not because I am separating many of my, the, if there's a unity of control, there's a unity of ownership, I have organized differently for different purposes of businesses. Maybe I require that. So I have done it for business reason. So if you look at control, was substance or form, it is actually one single unity. And therefore, you can tax one single unit. So what will be altered in the consolidated uh, taxation will be the person part of it. If the value will change, obviously, when you aggregate all the companies into one unit of taxation, the tax base also will get aggregated and you will have one single uh, larger piece of value for the tax base to be taxed as far as you are concerned. The rate of tax, obviously, if you have got multiple rates of tax applicable to different companies, those are all qualifications you have to meet. But as far as corporate taxation is concerned, the rate that is applicable to a company, that's the rate that will apply even a, tax, a consolidated tax regime and it should not alter. So if you find two components will get varied, one is the person, instead of individual company, it will become a group, and number two, the, the tax base, instead of having each company having a tax base, you will possibly have all the companies together and become one common base, and that's how it will go be done. So if you see two things, how do I aggregate all the companies? Should I use the consolidated financial statements, the accounting standard which is available for preparation of consolidated financial statements? Should I apply that? That will be a little vague for taxation because control is a uh, more uh, 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 a concept which is based on a little amount of understanding of larger piece of control. Tax laws cannot work based on control in so lucid terms. Today you may have a control, tomorrow you may not have a control. So tax laws typically work with ownership, which will be a surrogate for control. If you say I own 100% of a company, possibly you also say that you control the entire company. So whether the ownership can be a surrogate for the uh, control, and therefore normally you find consolidated regimes using a ownership yardstick and not a control yardstick as is used in control, uh, consolidated financial statements. So the tax base, there are multiple methods. Uh, what you do is whether, how the tax law should treat. When I got say 20 entities in a consolidated group, how do I treat each one of them? Whether I treat them as branches or divisions or I treat them as individual companies still and still manage to aggregate the incomes in some form. Normally when you keep the entities alive as they are, so if you have 20 companies and you keep all the 20 of them as if they are separate companies, but still you have a pooling method that the incomes and losses are all contributed into one aggregation, that will be called the pooling method. And pooling method is the most common methods countries use. 
The second one is called the absorption method. That is, you treat each of those companies, 20 companies, as if they are divisions and branches. That is, you abandon the corporate structure and restate it as if it's one large company which is sitting together with everybody, and you try and see whether you can do that as a second alternative. Yeah, absorption and uh, attribution is a slight variation which combines a little principles of pooling as well as absorption. It actually is an absorption method, but it uh, retains some amount of pooling elements. And a contribution method is well known in European structure that one company which earns a profit and another company of the same group has a loss, the profit company would contribute to the uh, uh, loss-making company, and the loss company would pick it up as an income. The contributing company would take it as an expenditure, a deductible expenditure. On the whole, you find that you have monetized your losses within the group. And that's the second, me fourth mechanism which is available. Within these four mechanisms, you find that the entire globe is organized as consolidation design. What is, a, what is a group? How large should be the group? How do, what is the metric on which I peak? One, I said that the ownership is a criteria. After all, ownership can be within a country. Ownership can travel beyond a country. Ownership can travel world over. So there are typically three kinds of groups which get evolved. One is called a country group. That is those entities which are all incorporated within the loss of one country. That will become one group and therefore it's called a country group. So if all the companies are incorporated in India, then India will become the country group. All the 20 entities within India will be consolidated into one group and that will be a country group. You may have a trade block. For example, the European Union will constitute something like a trade block. Anything which is incorporated within the European Union may all be together taken as one single company. And you may find a mechanism of allocate the states which are cooperated to become a trade block. They will have a mechanism of allocating the taxes collected amongst them, much like what our Finance Commission or the Niti Aayog is doing today, the states also have a similar arrangement that they will apportion the amount of taxes amongst the countries, but essentially the law treats all of them into one company by an option if they want to. The third one is a worldwide group, that is you treat no matter what, where your subsidies are incorporated, you treat them all of them into one single entity. There are certain countries which practice worldwide taxation and we can look at those models and see whether they would see. In a, in a vera era when technology is driven, internet is the basis. We, know, we do not bother where we are located. All the decisions are centralized and they are all over there for a moment in the sense anybody can take a decision anywhere. Uh, I think that the time has come that in an integrated, today we don't say I am Wipro limited. I say I am Wipro for the only reason that I look at my hundred or subsidies together. My businesses are organized as verticals. So what is this geographical, geographical separation which is going to do? So somewhere the worldwide consolidation is the principle which will emerge at some point in time. It also means that all the BEPS action which has been taken is all trying to say, okay, groups are tra trading within themselves, they are arranging concepts between, amongst themselves. There is a lot of anti-avoidance mechanism which is put for the re only reason that I have organized myself into multiple entities. The moment I have a consolidated assessment, all these BEX programs and other things may become even irrelevant because finally it is between there, if I am going to pay taxes at the headquartered company and the tax rate is quite reasonably high and which is comparable to the rates available in other country, where is the tax avoidance, where is the tax evasion, it is at best a tax distribution. A tax distribution cannot be a concern of the government as much as tax avoidance. So possibly you may find that the worldwide consolidation is the right principle which may be adopted at some point in time. So, what is a consolidated term? There are multiple practices. You, a term means how long this uh, regime should continue, whether it should be elective, mandatory. Uh, for a moment, it is elective. How long should be the term? Generally, countries have two programs. They say it's irrevocable. Once you opt into the scheme, it is irrevocable. You have to remain in the scheme. You cannot go out of it. It will be a consolidation scheme forever. As long as the ownership criteria is met, those companies will part of the group. The other one is elective. The elective itself means it's elective for some period. So people will say you can be in the consolidation term for five years. If you don't opt out of it, it will be an automatic renewal and you can keep on going perpetually. So you have typically two practices. One is irrevocable once you have opted. If the, I will say there are three methods. One is mandatory. Many countries have not put it mandatory. Some countries, countries introduced it as mandatory, later on withdrew it and said it's elective. 
once you have made it elective, but once the election is made, it is irrevocable. The, there are countries we say it is elective, but is revocable, but revocable after a term. So five years, three years, and so on and so forth. And revocable at any time is that at least there are countries which say you can offer it for even one year. And therefore, you can choose consolidation this year, and you need not be in a consolidated regime next year. That kind of a flexibility a couple of countries offer. So I think a country which is very mature and is willing to have a regime, they would leave it as an election, but irrevocable or revocable after a sufficiently long term so that it's not used as an avoidance term. So in a, what are the things we have to look in a consolidation? Very, uh, oh sorry, I have to skip here rather than, yeah, this sir. Uh, sorry, thanks for pointing out. Uh, what are the things we have to look at in a consolidated regime? One, what happened to, I may have to, one of the companies or many of the companies have a tax attribute called pre-consolidation losses. What do you do? Whether they lapse, will you cancel them? Or you'll say, no, anyway, it's a consolidated regime. Let the entire loss get transferred to the group as one. That's the second option. The third option is, let us now draw up a silo or a qu quarantine those losses, allow absorption of those losses from the very same profits those companies make in the future while they are part of the member, and allow those losses to be absorbed against those, uh, those profits. Normally, the practice is that they don't cancel. Cancellation is the least attractive. It virtually says that the all economic attributes of the past will get eliminated. It doesn't have any great attraction. Normally, no regime cancels it. Japan tried it, they reversed it. They made it a little optional, a little later. Yeah, so what is normally done is that they don't also allow that the past losses of companies can go into the group immediately. That means it will be revenue loss immediately. Suddenly you find losses which would not have got monetized in the normal course will all get monetized soon because you have allowed the entities to be treated as one single unit of taxation. So they follow the silo or quarantine method that the losses will be of that entity. It has to earn its profit. To the extent it earns profit, those losses can be set off the balance net profits alone get transferred to the consolidated group. So there's a liquidation mechanism which is allowed. So what do you do with consolidation losses during the term? That is, while all the members are part of the consolidation, if losses arise, that will be set off. That's the best part of consolidation, that you can set off the profits and losses against each other and have an income which may get generated. What about uh, intra-group asset transfers? Normally, if an intra-group asset transfers, if it's a group, that means that it should not get taxed immediately. The gain or loss should be deferred, should be one mechanism. Another mechanism is that you allow the gain or loss to be taxed in one hands, but the increased value will be anyway treated in the hands of the recipient, and therefore there may be a neutrality in that principle can be one. The general trend is the losses and gains are deferred, and it will be captured later. At what point it will be captured? When those assets are sold to a third party, or the contributing member has exited the uh, consolidation, or the recipient member has exited the consolidation. So the, uh, the company which has received, or the company which has contributed the uh, assets, or sold the assets, they will be treated as if, the moment they exit the consolidation, the gain will be taxed. So there can be intra-unit shares. For example, if you have 20 companies, if all of them have to be treated as a single unit of assessment, then the shareholding also gets a disturbance. For example, the dividends will not be taxed, and therefore, you need an adjustment to the value, holding value of the shares. Those are all continuously done at a different points in time so that you have got what is the holding value of your shares in a way that there's a mechanism to compute how much of share value should be retained in the books for the purpose of taxes. That's the way it works. Computation mechanism is very, very easy. All that you have to do is what will be the method, accounting year, tax year. We say in India that the previous year ends on 31st March whether all companies should end on 31st March, even in a worldwide consolidation, whether they should end on 31st March may not be possible. So some co most consolidation regimes prescribe that the tax period should be common. So you may have to align the tax period to the consolidation regime. Or you may have to prepare two sets of year, financial year closing is 31st December or calendar year. You may have to book, uh, prepare separate set of books to align to 31st March so that it aligns with the tax period. Should the accounting method be the same for every company? 
law says most of the countries say you don't have to have same accounting period, accounting method. You can have different accounting practices for different companies because each one is regulated differently. Each one has a business of its own. All the businesses may not have the, the same thread of principles of accounting. So you can have different accounting principles as far as you want. What should happen if my subsidiary is only 80% owned by me, whether I should consolidate 100% of the income? Law generally says that in a domestic consolidation, you don't apportion the 20% and take away that, you consolidate 100%. But in a cross-border consolidation, if you've got worldwide consolidation, for foreign companies, you pick up only that much of income that is attributable to the uh, shareholding or the control interest. And finally, tax liability, who bears the tax? is a joint and severance liability. There will be a parent company or head company which will be co constituted amongst yourself. Usually will be the highest, topmost com uh, company in this uh, scheme. And that company will bear the amount of taxes. And it will be uh, possibly at uh, certain times what happens, while the joint and severance liability may be there, for recovery purposes, they uh, sometimes what happens, the sun governments give a leeway that the taxes can be attributed to the respective members according to the share of income they have contributed. And you can actually fix that it's a liability to the, for recovery purposes may be attributed to a recovery in adverse circumstances, enforcement circumstances, it may be attributed to the subsidiary also. Succession, what happens is one company, the parent company gets acquired by another company. Normally, tax neutrality will be maintained. It is like amalgamation of one company with another company. It will be amalgamation of one group with another group. Automatically, there will be a tax neutrality with that particular scheme also. Loss offset is the benefit you get. Uh, elimination of intra-group transfer is the benefit you get. Uh, better cash management because dividend can flow without a tax effect. Higher deductions and credits which are based on percentage. For example, uh, yeah, if your uh, deductions are based on turnover or if your deductions are based on profit, you may be able to get a higher deduction because suddenly you find that you aggregated the profits together and what would not have otherwise occurred to you can come in this. There can be also disadvantage out of this because you may pick up losses of certain companies and it may reduce the aggregate in some way. Uh, lesser number of SARS, uh, that is uh, specific anti-avoidance regulations, will be remitted to the consolidation regime. You know, most of the SARS which are applicable in general parlance may all go away because they are all intended to deal with transactions between interse between companies. When you eliminated the interse between companies concept and take them as single unit of taxation, you may uh, find that this is a better mechanism. It works. Most of the SARS will go. GAR itself may not apply much because anyway you are saying that the entire group is a single unit of uh, uh, unit of assessment. Barring third party transactions where GAR may be looked at, transaction within yourself is already getting eliminated. So there is no need for a GAR to be so extensive and barred. So you may find that you escape GAR also. Uh, global competitiveness will be helped because suddenly you find that you are going to be assessed as a single unit and you are not going to be. Most countries have a consolidation design only to advance global competitiveness. Wherever global competitiveness has been low, countries would introduce a, a consolidation design to help the corporates consolidate into a single entity, set off the losses and profits into one, respect the economic unity of the, comp comp uh, the group, and assess as a single one. Ease of doing business, yeah, because if I have to ask today, I have got a dedicated team which will work on 20, 30 subsidiaries in India itself. Now suddenly I need, I don't need 30, 20 people. All I need is two member or five member team which will look at the assessments, filing, and the entire cycle. So you will find that there's an ease of business. You don't have to litigate on same file multiple times. You litigate once and you litigate, that's all. You follow the chain. And therefore, ease of doing business will go up. Ease of administration will go up. The assessing authority need not be 50 now. You will have one assessing authority who is a fairly decent expert with the line and he will assess you well. And therefore, ease of administration will go up and ease of compliance will go up for the custody. And ease of collection, that's a predictability. Once you are assessed as a group, then there is a predictability of taxes for the government will also go up along with that. And what is the limitation of that is that you need expertise. You are all people who have handled corporate taxation suddenly will have to graduate to a new level of taxation. Some amount of expertise is required for the associates and some amount of expertise is required for the department. And that's the starting point. Actually, a mental block is in the expertise. And once that is acquired to some level, which we will all acquire. Today, we are all settled with GST on a fragmentation basis. It was quite difficult to adopt to GST when it was used, introduced. 
we have reduced our struggle still we are struggling but not as much possibly but so you find that once a new regime comes the expertise will get acquired within a short period of time maybe 3 4 years everybody will settle well with that irrevocable status so if the law is irrevocable if the consolidation is irrevocable then you have made a permanent choice for those kind of kind of regime if it is election you can re revisit it every 5 years or 10 years depending on the term but if it is irrevocable you have made a permanent choice so is sitting today as the head of tax if i access a judgment for the company you find that i have left a legacy which others will have to perpetually hold which is irrevocable so to that extent i am making a post addition for posterity forego fragmentation benefits so wherever we are able to get fragment today a company which is for under 115 the new sections you are able to get a 15% rate you may not be able to get a 15% rate in a consolidation because you don't fit the qualification of a 15% so you know what you get in fragmentation you will not get it in consolidation can be one uh, rhythm alignment of tax period so how do i get every member uh, come into that for example if you say the loss as age is 8 years uh, and if some company is allowed to join the consolidation mid year say in december for a march year that means they are in consolidation for only 4 4 months that 9 months which they have spent independently will be treated as if it is one whole year so you actually count one year so if you are joined in june in 3 months itself can become one year for them so the year count sometimes can become a negative uh, uh, attribute for you which may have to be looked at uh, last one which is important is how do you apply the treaty the treaty look as each still may look at each a company as an enterprise but the consolidation regime is yours so some domestic law regulations will have to see how tax foreign tax credit will be allowed for you in a treaty situation and those are the regulations which are normally contained in the domestic law regime itself so last one if i have to only see alignment of the anti avoidance regulations whether transfer pricing will stop applying in domestic circumstances transfer pricing will stop applying technically but in cross border circumstances it may still apply because the countries are bothered not about mere consolidation they want arms length price to be the basis of transaction so you may find that in cross border uh, uh, the transfer pricing regulations may continue to be applied control foreign corporation will dissolve in a worldwide consolidation it is no not a concept at all because you are not anyway deferring anything all income get aggregated in the same unit so cfc as a concept will go away in a worldwide consolidation it may still be relevant in a country group where is only you are aggregating only the companies within a country place of effective management will become irrelevant because you have anyway brought the company within consolidation and therefore you don't need place of effective management as a concept where it will all fall into the same consolidated group and will get assessed as part of the domestic group so you don't need place of consolidation rules uh, uh, effective management rules at all and interest deduction so far we are able to get the 30% ebitda deduction on a company basis whether it should be applied to the group basis and therefore the interest should be elevated the deduction should be elevated to the group can be a matter of debate and generally wherever consolidated regime is there there is a trend to say that the interest deduction will be limited based on group results and not based on the uh, individual entity results countries which have pooling methods a uh, usa has got domestic pooling method and something like a absorption method or the check the box method which they use for cross border entities uh, france spain new zealand japan russia they all have pooling russia has introduced for large corporations very recently sometime in 2012 or 13 uk has a group relief mechanism and germany has a, some kind of a profit or loss contribution mechanism australia has absorption which treats the uh, subsidiary companies as branches and divisions Uh, Netherlands is based on fiscal unity which is an attribution principle Denmark Italy have joint taxation that is they have a national consolidation and they have international consolidation both streams operate together in some ways so you find that multiple regimes 12 countries are uh, uh, analyzed here and therefore you can have a feel of it prominent absent countries Brazil China and India China I understand has got some consolidated regime I have not been able to get a hold of the uh, regime there but brazil and india are prominent ex exceptions in this so you find that the entire corporate world may welcome it because we find today we to handle 30 odd assessments on an average i have talked about the initial figure as an average there are companies which have 100 subsidiaries and they operate it instead of having 100 subsidiaries and trying to see how to manage cross border business and domestic businesses together consolidation may appeal to many of them and say that this is the right regime so 
I would think that the government looking at the scale, ease of doing business as the reasons for many of them. As a trade-off on taxes, Arun did ask, what will be the trade-off taxes? I think the government should look at the loss may not be offsetable immediately, but sooner or later, if the government believes that loss is a bad loss, it is not capable of being monetized, I think the government should be worried about revenue loss. But they should not believe that the no loss is capable of being monetized. After all, sooner or later, the company is in business, they will monetize it in some way, sometime. And therefore, that should not be looked at as a loss, a loss of revenue immediately. Japan, when it introduced, they levied an additional 2% tax on consolidation. They said that there may be a loss of revenue, so let me collect 2% extra tax to compensate for the loss of revenue. It was not a popular regime. It was rejected almost. No corporate elected for the consolidated regime. So possibly there is an indication that loss, uh, set off and revenue loss should not be looked at as if it's a loss. You will find scale. You will be able to plug leakages of the intra-company uh, uh, entries which are made and the directions which accrue one to company and create a loss in the other company. All those things will be eliminated and you may find that the overall economics works quite well. And after some time, after two, three years, the regime settles well on its own and you will be able to get the same amount of revenue, even better, because your administration is focused, the return is one to assess, the intra-entity entity, uh, entries get eliminated, intra-entity transactions are not counted, you are only transactions with third parties are counted, that's the real profit which you are earning in any case. So actually it uh, boils down to taxing the real profits rather than taxing notional profits which they are trying to do now. I would say that the consolidation regime has come and DTC did not consider it possibly because the choice of methods, the regime they should have, all those things would have remained a little confusing for them. But the, uh, I would suggest that uh, today I am a little excited because the book is getting released tomorrow. But the book is a compelling reading to understand these concepts, saying that after we understand saying that this will be the right regime for large MNCs, Russia has done it, USA has done it. In USA, 65% of the companies offer for consolidated regime. They don't go for non-consolidated regime. Even small groups, even three companies, four companies, they prefer a consolidated regime. That's the way it's been working. Why? That they prefer because ease of operating. So I will end my session for the day. If there are questions, we can take it. This is a broad framework only I could cover. I did not go into too many details today because it's an uninitiated subject for many of us. And to talk too much depth, uh, technicality into this subject today will be a little overburden at this point in time. We'll take similar sessions at a later point in time as we get familiarized with the subject. It will be a common topic in all conferences, I can say. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs>